Uh, Rick is a prolific and internationally renowned scholar of Mexico. He's an excellent teacher and a generous colleague. His commitment to his discipline shines through in his research, his teaching, and his service to the department, university, and local and scholarly community. Rick's research is situated at the intersection of a number of major subfields in history, intellectual, political, and economic. Rick is the author and editor of three books, including one in Spanish. He's the author or co-author of 15 articles or book chapters, including three in Spanish, plus a dozen of smaller pieces like conference proceedings, reviews, and encyclopedia entries. His research has been supported by multiple grants, including uh, twice by the New Frontiers grant and, um, and a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, he has presented his research at conferences in the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America, many by invitation. So his, his, his work, his research, his scholarship has reached an audience far beyond the United States. And Rick's research is, um, is continuing to change and grow and evolve, and he's currently, among so many other things, is working on two new book projects. Rick, Rick is truly a model of, pro of research productivity uh, for, um, for faculty in, um, in our department. I don't have time to be able to go into all the detail of Rick's service to the profession, but I want to single out one thing. Um, since 2013, Rick has been the associate editor of, for, for reviews for the journal Enterprise and Society. I know it's been a lot of work for him him, but he has been able to transform it um, into an amazing opportunity for history majors and um, recent graduates. Um, our students have been able to work as assistant editors for him. They've been able, they've had opportunities to author or co-author book reviews, book review essays, um, and um, and have had opportunities to um, to work on and publish um, encyclopedia entries. And this is this is important to note because this is not something that's um, that's very common in our field. So it's really um, it's it's really been an ama um, a professional opportunity that Rick has been able to to convert into something that has benefited um, so many other um, students on this um, on this campus. Uh, beyond his scholarship, I want to mention the import of Rick's importance as a leader in our department. Um, nobody's more supportive of his faculty than. Rick. He's always looking out for us, making sure we have everything that we need to accomplish our professional goals and supporting us in our endeavors. He's a man of integrity and somebody who has served as an advocate for students and faculty, not just in our department, uh, but in other departments as well. And many of you, of course, have had the pleasure of having him as your external reviewer um, or on your, um, on your PNT committees. The honor of being selected as the COAS Internal Distinguished Lecturer is not just fitting a acknowledgement and celebration of Dr. Weiner's accomplishments up to now but also an encouragement of more great things to come. Um, and of course, given the presence of Mexico in our contemporary political discourse, a lecture called Mexico and the American Imagination seems particularly timely um, and particularly important. Um, and so it's my pleasure to, to welcome him to the stage and to present him with this plaque. Well, I want to say thank you for that generous introduction. Um, thank you so much. And I also wanted to say thank you for uh, selecting me for the, to, for, to give this lecture. It's a great honor to be recognized by one's colleagues. So thank you very much for that. I also wanted to say thanks to the History Department for all the support I've received from it over the years. COAS faculty, because you know, they've listened to my talks over the years and we've bounced ideas off one of another. Uh, also, the support I've received from ORES in RESP in the whole grant system here. I mean, I really wouldn't have been able to pursue research to the extent that I've been able to with all, without all this great support. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much to my colleagues in IPFW for that. This talk, uh, I had to do some reflection for this talk. What I, what I started reflecting about was that we've seen recently uh, a lot of visibility for Mexico. And from the Republican primaries to the recent capture of the drug lord El Chapo and his bizarre connection with Sean Penn who interviewed him before he was captured to 
just a couple of days ago, we saw that in the news that UTEC in Huntington is relocating to Mexico. So it, I began to reflect on the fact that Mexico has paid a lot of attention to. And if you actually look at the, straight, the trade statistics, um, we have more trade with Canada than Mexico. But Mexico is much more visible. And I began reflecting that this is nothing new, that there's a long history of this. So that's what this talk is about, reflecting on the long history of, of Mexican visibility in American discourse. Uh, and I want to make a few basic points. One of the explanations of this long history is that Mexico has been seen as distinct and thus very visible. Uh, indeed, while there have been attempts to acknowledge commonalities, differences stand out. Interestingly, these, dis these uh, depictions of Mexico have been contradictory, which gives rise to the title of the talk, Scrambled Pictures. Also, the contradictions help explain American fixation with Mexico in the sense that there's been great controversy associated with Mexico. And that has given even greater rise and greater attention. One thing you might, I'm gonna develop a little bit in the talk is to what extent are these depictions of Mexico in imperial imposition? And what I'm going to say is that in certain instances, Mexico has bristled at representations of its nation here in the United States. But sometimes Mexico actually has been an agent of these representations and promoted them. Things might have been different in the sense that there have been scholars, um, a famous one, Herbert Bolton in the 1930s, who wrote something called the, the Epic of Greater America. And Bolton's argument was that the Americas have a common history. American exceptionalism really isn't so exceptional. They had a common, um, a common colonial period, a common age of independence where they broke free from Europe, in 19th century Republican development. Some scholars today have focused on this, talked about actually commonalities and connections between Spanish America and British America during the colonial era and continuities after that. However, this voice hasn't really won out and we have more of a depiction and portrayal of difference, which I think partly explains the great attention. This talk is divided into four sections. The first section looks at the age of independence in the early 19th century. The second section looks at the late 19th century era of Mexican modernization and the export boom. The third section looks at revolutionary Mexico with the revolution of 1910 going up to the 1970s or so. And the last section looks at our current age, the age of globalization. Before, before starting with the age of independence, I wanted to begin with some quick colonial antecedents. And what we see in the colonial period is our two developments that become very important afterwards. A concept of desire and a concept of difference. Let me start with desire. As we all know, the largest civilization in the Western Hemisphere when the Europeans arrived was the Aztec Federation. Some have numbered it as high as 25 million. Uh, it, it, whatever the case may be, it was far larger than any other civilization. It is a place that Spain colonized. It's where Spain's first center of colonization existed. Furthermore, Spain had the good fortune of encountering precious metals there, which enabled for great exploitation of them and there was a fleet system that sent these metals to Europe, but also to Asia, the Manila Galleon. So this certainly seemed like something of uh, a windfall for Spain. And when 
the Virginia Company arrived in 1607, it seemed like a bust. They had been hoping for um, the idea of finding another Aztec Federation, um, precious metals, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't. But this desire for the Spanish holdings and to emulate them continued. Thomas Gage, an English writer, came to Mexico. He talked about the wealth there, the possibilities there, and he also noted very weak military defense. This idea that maybe we can take this. Britain did take Jamaica from Spain and developed it as a sugar colony. We also had Sir Francis Drake and the Buccaneers working to uh, steal Spanish silver. So there, this seemed like really the most promising area of the New World at this time. There was also a difference, as I noticed, m mentioned at this time. The difference was this. Spanish America was viewed as distinct from British America. And the, a lar a, to a large degree, this is explained by the black legend. The black legend was sort of originated by Las Casas, a Francisus monk who went to the Spanish holdings in the Caribbean and harshly critiqued them in the early 16th century. Now, Las Casas, he may have been a reformer. He may have wanted to do away with colonialism altogether. He, whatever the case may be, he harshly critiqued the, what he depicted as a ruthless style of Spanish colonization. Other European nations gravitated to that depiction, and they began to advertise the ruthless nature of Spanish colonization. And of course, these other nations were competing with Spain, so it was in their interest to discredit it. So these are two important developments in the colonial period. Going over independent, into independence, the main, um, and if we look at the early national period, maybe the 1820s to 1860s, the main depictions coming out of the United States are, one is desire, another is danger, and there's also great controversy. The, the issue here is that uh, coming off the Age of Independence, there was a famous work by Alexander von Humboldt who had visited Mexico or New Spain at just before independence broke out, and he wrote this account that accentuated the great wealth there. He talked about the agricultural wealth, the mineral wealth, the diverse ge geography in which anything under the sun could be grown, and he predicted grandeur and maybe dominance in the Western Hemisphere for Mexico. It's worth noting that his book was quickly translated into, it was originally um, written in French, translated to English, Spanish, German. The year it appeared in French, 1811, it also had an English version. This was his, probably his most disseminated book that he ever wrote. And so we have this notion of great wealth in Mexico. And this actually kind of connects with American expansionist ideals. After Humboldt went to Mexico, he went to the United States. He met with Jefferson. He gave Jefferson his information. Pike, another American, actually stole some of Je um, Humboldt's maps. And there are some who claim that, you know, therefore Humboldt is, ex is responsible for the Mexican-American War. Whatever the case may be on that, the, what we see in American discourse in this early period is great desire for Mexico. Right, there were um, repeated uh, attempts to purchase Mexico uh, by the United States, by US diplomats. It fit with Jefferson's idea of an empire of liberty um, spanning across space, not through time, a nation of farmers. We also see during this period multiple filibusters, that is, independent Americans with their independent Amer uh, armies going into Mexico and trying to take, for instance, the northwestern state of Sonora. So we can see some great desire in this period. And also, if someone like, uh, like Jefferson didn't think that the new Latin American countries were capable of um, managing themselves. And 
along with desire, we see a lot of danger in this period. And the danger, namely, is, from the American perspective, is foreign threats. Mexico is viewed as a weak state that cannot defend itself, and it's going to be carved up, and America better get there first. We can see some of these current concerns with foreign powers as early as the 1804-1806 um, the, the uh, expedition, Lewis and Clark, that Jefferson promoted as a way to explore the West, but also stake out American interests in territorial rights. If we move forward to Latin American independence in the 1820s, we can see the Monroe Doctrine. Now, the Monroe Doctrine was an American doctrine which claimed that Europe, Europe had been kicked out of the Americas and Europe could, should not come back, and that there's a commonality here that the Europe has been um, expelled and these American republics deserve their sovereignty. Europe can have its sphere, the Americas have their own sphere. If we moved forward to the 1830s, one of the big issues about this danger, and again, this danger is about other foreign powers, not something so much about Mexico. It's about other foreign powers stepping in. We can see the, the issue of Texas. Texas um, breaks off from Mexico in 1835, creates an independent country in 1836, um, mostly with American settlers. And there's great concern after this on the American part that Britain will step in and become influential because it remains an independent state for about a decade. On the other side, Europe is scared that the United States will step in. And Europe um, tries to cut a deal with Mexico saying, you recognize Texan independence, and if you do that, we will guarantee that Texas won't be annexed by the United States. So we can see this. Uh, back and forth concerns on all sides. Uh, nevertheless, eventually Texas is annexed, and we see the Mexican-American War break out, but even you could argue the Mexican-American War has an aspect of this concern about foreign control, because the manifest destiny that Polk espoused connected to the war was, a di was an ideology that talked about expanding the area of freedom, and that if um, we want to instill Republican institutions in these areas and make sure that Europe doesn't come and occupy them. They even used manifest destiny on Mexico. Mexico, it was said, had um, harsh rulers, didn't care for its people, and by us taking over this territory, it will in fact liberate Mexicans and have them live under free institutions. Even after the Mexican-American War, this desire for this weak Mexican state doesn't end. In the 1860, France, during the American Civil War, invades with 30,000 troops. They create the Second Empire. Justification for it? We want to take it before the Americans take it. So you can see that uh, even though Mexico successfully expels the French, this period is a period in which the United States sees the prime danger in the area being the recolonization of Europe. I mentioned the issue of controversy, too. And controversy is an important, probably in this early period, is one of the most important um, features of the American discourse. The big contrary, as controversy, as you know, was slavery. Before the war started, or just as it was about to break out, we had the Wilmot Proviso. The Wilmot Proviso said that the, the lands we take from Mexico have to be free. And it gave rise to the Free Soil uh, Party and also the popular sovereignty position. That is, let the people decide if slavery should exist in the West or not. It's been recognized by historians that this controversy which started with Mexico over if slavery should exist in the West, led to the American Civil War. There were some countercurrents in the discourse during this period. People who sought to describe Mexico and the United States as having greater similarities. One was Humboldt's own writing, ironically enough. Humboldt 
talked about the interconnections between different areas in the Western Hemisphere. And actually, some scholars have given him credit for helping develop the concept of the Western Hemisphere. And to some extent, Humboldt, who was close friends with Jefferson, was um, articulating a rejoinder to Jefferson's notes on Virginia, which had this very insular view. Also, the, the Monroe Doctrine itself. Some revisionist scholarship has said that it wasn't an American imposition, but actually uh, Mexicans and other Latin Americans hoping to bolster their own independence and alliance with the United States were supporting that. Further, when before the Texas debacle where it broke off from Mexico, Mexicans saw the, United, saw the United States as an ally, and therefore the idea of bringing American colonists in to, air, to colonize an area that was fertile but had limited population. However, this idea of difference is also pushed by Mexico. And uh, so it's not just a foreign representation. And of course, part of it has to do with the Mexican-American War and the fact that Texas broke off from Mexico. And interestingly, it also has to do with the filibusters that took place. One of the most famous ones was in the 1850s when William Walker um, went to Nicaragua and uh, defeated the government and pro proclaimed himself president. And it caused a huge controversy for years in Latin America. The US government recognized him. And it helps give rise to the concept of Latin America as a not a French imposition, but as something that um, Mexicans and other Latin Americans used as an identity to distinguish them, some, themselves from the United States. If we move to the Porphyrian period, the latter part of the 19th century, this is a period in which uh, we have a different discussion, representation of Mexico. I mean, the, in a sense, the age of foreign invasion has ended. And Mexico has tried to show itself not as a weak state, but as a strong state, because when they captured Maximilian, the emperor of Mexico that France installed, they executed him. And the, and the message was in the late 1860s, don't come and invade again. The Porphyrian period is um, the late 19th century. It's called the Porphyrian period because Porfirio Diaz rules from 1876 to 1910. And it's a period of great economic modernization. Right? Mexico's exports increase tenfold. Um, railroads are built. Cities come up. Industries are created. And uh, it's an era of great modernization for Mexico. It's the main depictions coming out of the United States at this time is one of desire. There's not actually much danger here. There isn't much controversy either. Um, the, one of the big issues here in terms of the desire was twofold. On the one hand, the, there was a claim in some US financial interests and financial quarters that America had to expand economically that um, it was basically a capitalist theory of imperialism uh, or financial imperialism. Charles Conant was an important uh, American propagandist and thinker and also helped the US government put some countries on the gold standard. And he wrote about this dilemma of capital glut. There's too much capital in the United States and not enough outlets for it. To, in order for our capitalism to survive, it needs to expand across national borders. And he also had a Darwinian angle to all this. And the idea was that we have to compete with the other world powers in this. Where should we go? Conan and others wrote probably more about Mexico than any place else. Bankers Magazine, a financial magazine, dedicated about half the entire journal to it. Basically, what we have here is a continuation of the Humboldtian ideal. Mexico, a rich nation with great opportunity and great possibilities for economic development. Then the question becomes, well, why hasn't it happened already? And the discourse was basically political instability, and that had been a problem in the early 19th century for sure. Um, lack of financial resources, 
Uh, also, though, a lot of it had to do with the lazy native syndromes. You know, the Mexicans are, you know, they're content to sit on the beach and maybe eat a few bananas. I mean, the idea that, you know, that we don't really need to work and we don't have a materialist ethic. So the idea here is with American technology, American know-how, American capital, the, op the, the possibilities are limitless. Also, given the fact that there, there was great stability in Mexico and it seemed to be friendly to foreigners. The, so th this, um, this is the American discourse, and it's also worth noting that this discussion um, also talks about the issue of foreign, foreigners and foreign competition. Ameri the United States, the first place it really advanced in terms of finance capital abroad was Mexico. Some scholars have called it a spillover. American railroads, American mining interests just go across the border. Over half U.S. investment in the late 19th century, foreign investment that is, was in Mexico. And it allowed for a discourse of American triumphalism. Yes, the, some of the wealthiest investors in the world were in Mexico. The Rothschilds, Lord Cadre from Britain, but the United States was winning the fight. And they made a big deal out of the fact that there was a loan floated in New York, a Mexican loan, and it was just the beginning that loans floated um, would be, uh, London wouldn't be the world's financial center anymore. Also, there was this idea that Mexico was a springboard. There was writing about the open door to China and saying, you know, we've been looking in the wrong direction. Look at all the profits we've made in Mexico. South America is next. We're going to push the British out. So this is really a discourse, I think, of uh, American desire, but also American uh, triumphalism, American success. Uh, the, you might wonder about how Porfirio Diaz was represented in all this. Here's a guy who ruled for over 30 years, reelected perpetually until he was 80, and actually, the United States, by and large, uh, at one point, he was called Man of the Year. You know, the idea was that he's created, he's pacified Mexico, he has modernized Mexico, and there might have been this idea that, you know, this is a country of incapable of governance and therefore authoritarian rule makes sense. What role did, uh, what role did Mexico play in all this? Uh, it seems that actually Mexico, the American discourse was largely in keeping with the Mexican discourse. So what we see in Mexico is the DS regime uh, bribing journalists to write good stories. We see Mexico in international expositions and other venues. We see also the creation of this sort of smoke and mirror um, security force, the rurales, the idea that this is a, a safe, stable place where high levels of, of invest, uh, profits can be made. So it was kind of a, a common discourse and Mexico probably helped create it. The only difference would be that in this case, we could say that the, uh, the, there was a nationalist element to it and certainly uh, Mexico didn't accept the notion of American dominance and it did take steps to weaken it like nationaling the railroads. If we move to the period of the Mexican Revolution, the, we can kind of date the Mexican Revolutionary period, or I have, from the 1910s to the 1970s. And I think what we see in this period, in terms of the discourse, we see uh, desire, danger, but also the danger isn't so great, because there's also common ground and actually, there isn't that much controversy. I mean, I don't want to make out that certain people didn't bristle and get very upset at certain historical moments, but overall, there's not a huge controversy that takes place. Now, this is the period that uh, there is a revolution. It overthrows the Porfirian state and installs the Institutional Revolutionary Party. This revolution takes place from the 1910s to 1920s, and the, that party with those revolutionary credentials remains in power for, throughout the 20th century. So it, there's a large anti-imperialist rhetoric and nationalist rhetoric, 
that is associated with this new regime. So let me first talk about the dangers that were in this discourse. Well, one of the dangers was, had to do with, I, is about anti-imperialism. So with the 1910 revolution, a popular revolution, which a half a million people died in, we have the construction of the 1917 Constitution. Now, the 1917 Constitution, among other things like social rights, talks about sovereignty. And it maintains that the subsoil rights belong to the nation. The immediate fear is that American oil interests, which have developed really quickly at the onset of the 20th century, are going to be expropriated. And in fact, there were calls for invasion, for an invasion of Mexico. The, um, from the United States. The, the president resisted it. The US government doesn't recognize the Mexican government until 1923 when they promise that they, Article 27, which allows for expropriation, won't be enacted retroactively. Nevertheless, these, these uh, revolutionary concerns continue. And in fact, in 1938, the United, uh, Mexico expropriates US and British oil interests. Other revolutionary concerns, uh, Sandino, who was a Nicaraguan nationalist who was opposing the US Marines occupation, went to Mexico. Uh, Castro went to Mexico before his successful revolution. So Mexico is associated with this anti-imperialist nationalism. The other concern or danger is to what extent will Mexico be connected to anti-US global alliances? And we see in World War I, there's a Zimmerian telegram, which um, is a, a reaching out of Germany to Mexico, asking for an alliance in, in, for, in exchange for which Germany will help Mexico regain the territories that were taken in the Mexican-American War. Um, we also see with after the oil expropriation in 1938, uh, Mexico trading with Germany and American concerns about fascism in Mexico and um, actually US anti-propaganda films, um, anti-fascist films that were circulated in Mexico. We also see with the Cold War that the United States is trying to get Latin America on its side through the organization of American states, but Mexico continually, um, they condemn US intervention um, or aid to the the coup that overthrew Allende in Guatemala. They, they critique the United States on expelling uh, Cuba from the Organization of American States. When the Allende regime comes to power and it's overthrown and the US has something to do with it in Chile, there is concern on that. Um, Mexico registers its complaints. Also in Nicaragua, when they have a successful revolution in the 70s and the United States tries to solve it militarily, Mexico and other Latin American countries propose the Contadora Pact as an alternative. So there definitely is concerns there that you know, Mexico's radicalism may undermine the United States strategic alliances in the Cold War. However, what I would argue is that there was also a common ground. And the common ground, for instance, was US-Mexican participation and collaboration in World War II. Um, and even before that, the United States policy towards Mexico and Latin America called the good neighbor policy, an idea of what we, we've kind of treated these people with too harshly and we want to now collaborate with them. Um, we also see during and after the war, the Bracero program where Mexican workers came to the United States to aid in that, um, in the war effort. So there's a lot of there's also some common ground in collaboration that kind of mitigates the danger aspect. And I think that actually one of the reasons for that, we can explain that, is there was something at stake. There was the Cold War, there was World War II, and that there were, you know, whichever way Mexico might, if they might take a, a turn the wrong way, we would be in trouble. And I think that the United States recognized that Mexico's revolutionary rhetoric, national rhetoric, was to some extent a, a justification or a legitimation of the regime. For instance, despite this rhetoric uh, of nationalism and anti-imperialism, 
we see an anti-communist league in Mexico. So the United States never really feared Mexico would go to the Soviet side. So these dangers were mitigated somewhat. What about the desires? Well, the desires with Mexico at this time are pretty interesting. They're the flip side of the dangers. They are in the sense that uh, the revolutionary Mexican state is in vogue, right? It's a state that uh, is associated with agrarianism and an agrarian revolution for traditional Indian villages. It's also a state that's sort of associated with nationalism and national sovereignty. There are great artistic elements to it. All these sort of these revolutionary symbols, um, artists like Diego Rivera painted these pa uh, murals, right? They're not paintings, they're murals that go outside in the public, not paintings that are private and go into museums. And they um, depict these kind of, uh, they celebrate Mexican workers, they celebrate, celebrate the indigenous population, and this all is very attractive to certain elements in the United States. So we have, for instance, during the revolution, Frank Tannenbaum go down and celebrate the agrarian revolution in Mexico, and we have Robert Redfield, the anthropologist, celebrate, uh, go and, and study indigenous societies in Mexico. We have, even up till today, groups of anthropologists that, that go to Mexico to study those groups. Um, we, we have, um, even before that, with the Mexican Revolution itself, some of those revolutionary leaders like Pancho Villa were very seductive. And we have John Reed go down to Mexico and hang out with, with Pancho Villa and write about him. And Hollywood actually did a film about him. Um, we also have this idea that part of the revolutionary state in Mexico is, is all about racial, kind of a racial paradise. Unlike the United States, Mexico and Latin America don't um, discriminate racially. And we have people like Langston Hughes and other black nationalists escape American segregation and Jim Crow laws by going to Mexico. So it's a period in which there's great appeal of a certain segment of the population. It's worth noting that Mexico sort of takes advantage of that, and it, it sort of morphs into the tourist industry. The tourist industry in Mexico is the biggest one in Latin America. It starts in the mid 20th century, and it's the idea of you know, a desire, of American desire for beaches, but also this ide ideal to get away from sort of modernity, get back to traditional society. And we can even see that way the Mexican state is commodified that with things like ballet folklorico. Um, if we go to the, to, to the southern Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula, during the late 19th century, it had been part of the export boom, but now it becomes El Mundo Maya or the Riviera Maya, which is a, a tourist attraction. Um, along these lines, we also get, in more recent decades, Americans who are struggling, uh, middle class Americans, to continue the way of life as the retirement comes on, and Mexico is escape as a retirement community. What about Mexico and all these representations? Well, it seems that Mexico actually had a large role in was promoting them. Um, in terms of a revolutionary state with revolutionary credentials that houses people like Castro and is anti-imperialist, after all, Mexico had been invaded, uh, Mexico kind of uh, promotes and sells this image. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the issue of exotic Mexico, that the, the Americans can get something they can't get at home, which is so important to fueling the tourist industry, is something that the government pushed really hard starting in the 1950s. Well, let us turn to globalization, the current era. And what I have to say about globalization is it seems to me that there are two main depictions, one desire, the other danger, but also this is a controversial period. Uh, more so, probably, we hadn't had one that was so controversial since the early 19th century. And 
um, just to give you a sense of what Mexico is doing in this period, it's worth noting that Mexico makes a really fast about face in the sense that it, um, that if we think about the 1970s, Luis Echeverria was president. He positioned himself as leader of the third world, leader of the non-aligned movement, not with the Soviets, not with the Americans, um, third world solidarity. 1988 to 1994, Carlos Salinas is president of Mexico. He buys into and is an important agent of um, the, the kind of new neoliberal ideals, sometimes people have called the Washington Consensus, this attraction of foreign investment. Um, some people have called the era of this era the Neo-Porphyrian era because it's again a, a period of great connections between the two countries and commercially. And uh, Salinas had a bid to be president of the World Trade Organization. So Mexico makes this incredible about face um, that Salinas says the lesson we learned from the Soviet Union is they moved to, um, to, into this new, uh, from this bipolar world into this globalization era too slow. We have to move faster. So Mexico um, privatizes communal lands. Um, works to create stability, works to create investment and um, in foreign in interest. So it's a real change during this period. Um, let me just look at three controversial issues. One, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Now, uh, on the one side, we can see the North American Free Trade Agreement, great desire, right? We know in the United States it was pushed heavily by certain interests. And we also know that the uh, the argument in part was that this is going to help United States economic expansion. And within this, there's a depiction of Mexico as, a, as kind of a developing nation on the, on the brink of becoming modern. And as it's on the brink of becoming modern, it, it, we're going to have uh, more opportunities to sell U.S. commercial goods to Mexico. Therefore, the North American Free Trade Agreement will help the United States. And in addition to this, we see that there's a similar depiction in Mexico, right? The Salinas government who's selling this is saying that this will be a development that will bolster both economies and that help Mexico move into first world status. A another benefit, as opportunities created in Mexico, we won't have to deal with the problem of um, undocumented people crossing the border. They won't need to go to the United States anymore. Uh, so, on the one hand, we have this very positive view, and also, if you just look on the ground, um, any corner in, in Mexico, we can see a Starbucks today. They're ubiquitous. Walmart's biggest sort of um, foreign expansion globally is in Mexico. So, these companies certainly have profited from this. But on the other side, we have danger. Right? And the danger, we could see it even when NAFTA was being promoted. We have, um, we have the Ross Perot in the presidential debates of, in the early 90s talking about a huge sucking sound. Right? And the idea that NAFTA would be a job killer in the United States and, and companies would go south across the border. And this was the prime, one of the main critiques of NAFTA, this idea that it was sort of, it would hurt American unions, American unions opposed it. It would, uh, the only attraction Mexico had was cheap labor and also lack of environmental standards, so environmentalists were concerned, and that basically this is a, um, a deal for the business class, but nobody else, and it's going to wreak havoc on the United States in terms of standard of living, job, um, jobs, and so forth. And of course, that, those divisions have remained over that. The, it's interesting to note that some of the critics of NAFTA in Mexico and the United States kind of hooked up. And one way it was done was the Zapatista movement of the 1990s. Um, this is a traditional um, southern Mexico January 1, 1994, the day NAFTA passed, they had a revolt and overtook some cities in Chiapas. And they sort of became romantic revolutionaries. 
and the anti-globalization movement globally became very enamored with them. They had these meetings in the jungle, and Americans came to these meetings to protest against globalization. They became connected to the 1999 World Trade Organization um, event in Seattle where it, the event was overthrown or, or broken into by protesters. Turning to another controversial topic at this time, drugs. The, the drug war and the, the drug expansion in Mexico starts uh, really in the 90s, and it's really exploded in the 2000s. On the one hand, in the United States, what we can see is a great concern about this. And we can even hear it just in discourse today. One of the concerns are people like El Chapo, the drug lord, well, he's been captured now, but the links between Mexican cartels and their connections in the United States. Also, there's this idea of violence spilling across the U.S. border from Mexico because of this. Um, a huge concern, too, is the, the drugs themselves in addiction in the United States. On the opposite side, I think we see desire. And it's seen in a couple of ways. Um, one way it's seen is through this idea of consumption. Some, some uh, people who want to say that this is a binational problem, not a Mexican problem that's Mexican wreaking havoc on the United States, say that American consumers are also to blame. If we didn't have those consumers, it wouldn't be happening. Another issue, too, it seems to me around desire, is that there's starting to be different attitudes about drugs. And drugs are being legalized in the United States. So there's this sort of American desire for this Mexican product. The last, oh, um, on this too, this controversy, you could argue, is connected to El Chapo, the Mexican drug lord. On the one hand, he is a, a drug lord who is ruthless and responsible for addictions and, and countless deaths. On the other hand, in, in northern Mexico, he's something of a folk hero who provides jobs, kind of a romantic revolutionary. I'm not sure that's exactly where Sean Penn thought him to be and why he interviewed him exactly, but you can see maybe seeing a strange analogy between John Reed hanging out with Pancho Villa, the revolutionary, and Sean Penn hanging out with El Chapo. The last point I'll make here is on immigration. Well, immigration, and let's start with the dangerous side of it. Uh, well, the first point to make is that uh, being concerned about foreigners is nothing new. We can gate it back to the 1850s with the Know Nothing Party that went after the Irish. Um, if we want to think about the case of, uh, uh, of Mexicans coming to the United States, concerns, while there were concerns earlier, undoubtedly, they really pick up in the 80s and 90s. And this is a, you know, part of it is their higher levels of migration because of population growth and because of some destabilization associated with, and job loss associated with NAFTA. And um, we can see the utilization of this immigration discourse for political ends with the Pete Wilson cam um, campaign to be reelected um, governor of California in the early 90s and how things weren't going well, and he blamed it on the, the, the undocumented people there. Um, so and we can see, in general, since then, it's been a prominent feature in American discourse, right? And the idea is that these people are going to bring lawlessness. They're going to, um, they're going to be a, uh, a drain on the US uh, political and economic system. They're going to be applying for you know, welfare rights, and they're also going to be clogging up our school system with bilingualism. And we can also see the, the growth of groups like the Minutemen on the border who you know, are this um, a militia group, um, or the Paper Please Law with Jan Brewer in um, Arizona. And so the, it, it's interesting to note that it seems to me that they don't have too many, despite the, the, the call for, uh, you know, some calls for legalization of status, they don't have that many de, um, defenders. Well, we, ha uh, we have a black rights, uh, black lives movement, uh, black lives matter movement. We don't have a Latino lives matter movement. We do have a couple of 
uh, Hispanic presidential candidates in the Republican Party today, they're Cuban Americans. It's a whole different group. In fact, the Cubans have had special status since the Cold War, and right now, Cubans are scrambling to get here before that special status might be ended by, by um, normalized relations. On the desire side, or the positive side, of this issue of immigration, it seems that the idea is that market forces sort of are the main force in all this. Like, we have a situation in which uh, that basically supply and demand. If there's a demand, workers come to fill that demand. The, the, the people who come here um, do a, have an uh, important economic service. There was a, a movie that characterized this about California, and they um, forced out all the undocumented workers, and the whole state shut down. The, and we can see this, too, um, in, in this kind of more positive um, depiction of it in some uh, economists' take on the job market, arguing that, in fact, um, undocumented workers don't really depress wages. Um, we, can, we can also see it in concerns by border governors like Rick Perry. I mean, the question is this. You have an underclass that has been discriminated against and been isolated and marginalized. The, we all know the term now, living in the shadows. And the idea is that this isn't good for American society, right? And we don't want to create a two-tier society, and therefore, expanding education, social, medical rights is a healthy thing f for the United States. Um, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that uh, my reflection sort of began upon the fact that Mexico's been in the news a lot lately, and that, and then I reflected that, well, this is actually nothing new. What I hope I've shown is that there's a long history of focus on Mexico, and it's partly explained by these kind of contradictory images of desire and danger, and also controversy, in part caused by divisions within American society about Mexico. Thank you very much. Rick, thank you so much for uh, that talk. That was uh, uh, great fun, and you've given us so much to think about uh, desire, danger, controversy as uh, metaphors uh, describing our relationship uh, with Mexico and how it's portrayed. Uh, I myself, as I was sitting there, was reflecting on, for instance, this recent TV show, The Bridge. I don't know if you had occasion to watch it. Any Bridge fans out there? I'm the only one, the <laughs> two of us. Uh, it was really, it didn't last very long. It only lasted for two seasons uh, recently, but they were really, it was very compelling television. Uh, and it was about, you know, it took place, uh, the bridge that separates uh, the United States from Mexico in El Paso. Uh, and the whole show was about desire, danger, and controversy uh, centered in that uh, kind of city torn in two there uh, at the border. Really compelling stuff. We only have about 10 minutes, but uh, Dr. Weiner is happy to take questions for a few minutes. Yes. Um, I, I have a question regarding, I guess it's a statement and a question. I'm sorry. Um, it, it seems that uh, you sort of pass over the conquest of Mexico as not be, as just being sort of an isolated event um, that, you know, we took approximately 60% of the territory of Mexico 20 some years after their independence. And the you mean race- Mexican-American war, you mean? Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, and it was part of, again, the strategy of Jefferson, as you pointed out, in terms of the empire of liberty, of promoting settlement. The Mexican government actually promoted gov uh, settlement of whites from America into Texas, thinking that would stabilize the situation. They would actually be able to claim it as, you know, continue to own it. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is it seems that 
you know, our whole race relations, our relations towards Mexican Americans or Mexicans in the whole southwestern United States is in part an artifact of the fact that we conquered Mexico and displaced a good portion of that population. Fifteen years earlier, we attempted the same thing with Canada, um, which we failed in terms of the conquest of Canada. But that legacy of conquest, and then certainly you made the point that the Civil War was, you know, in part ignited by the new territory that the United States acquired. But um, I guess I can't help thinking that, you know, this conquest didn't end. You had the penetration after the Civil War, economic penetration into Mexico. I mean, it's really seems to be more of a client state of the United States. And, and that, I know during the revolutionary period they talked about that, but it seems like that would be a major factor in terms of how we still view Mexico and the problem of the flood of immigrants coming from Mexico. That's really an artifact of that history of conquest. I think that the conquest was a big deal. And actually, initially I thought you were going to talk about the Spanish conquest, but the one thing pointed out in the, in the Mexican-American War is that the Americans took the same route that the Spaniards took when they went into Mexico City, so, um, which is kind of interesting. The, so it even goes back further in a sense. The, after the, I mean, I think that these things are consequential. And in the Porfirian period, this export boom era, there was a discourse of uh, critics of the DS regime who claimed it was an area, uh, an era of peaceful conquest, right, through money. And so this, and also, when the Mexican Revolution of 1910, you could argue that that revolution, I think, was really a civil war. It wasn't, there have been debates, people have claimed that it was uh, a national, the first nationalist revolution of the 20th century, but some of the nationalist elements in that war um, in that revolution are a consequence of U.S. occupation during the 1910 revolution. And one of the things that the revolutionary state claimed after that was that it didn't want to be Cubanized. And Cubanized was this idea of the Platt Amendment right. that is a client state, and Mexico certainly um, didn't consider itself that. But if you just take recently the, for instance, um, with the whole issue of the drug war, uh, and the, the cartels in Mexico. The Calderon, the previous president from 2006 to 2012, he worked carefully with the United States and the U.S. military sources. The new president in 2012 has pushed that off. You could argue that because of the, the issue of drugs and instability in Mexico, the United States has actually you know, its power has been enhanced, and there is a big debate about that. So I would totally agree with you. How much, how much of that in the drug war issue, I mean, the homicide rate quadrupled in about a four-year period from, right. from, from 2010 to 2014. How much of that was the reaction in terms of that election in 2012 where, you know, there was a change in policy? <clears throat> I think, well, okay, when there was a, one interesting thing is that when there was a change in policy and Enrique Peña Nieto took the presidency in 2012, he was almost like another Carlos de Salinas. His argument was that, you know, we need to attract investment. We talked about that oil nationalization of 1938. He wants to privatize the, oil, the Pemex. And so he went on with this rhetoric of, Let's not worry about instability in Mexico, about drugs. It's a safe place. Come invest here. He was like, he was a big promoter. That fell, it fell on his face. I don't know if um, that lack of, I don't know if, in fact, the increase is a consequence of the change in leadership and the change in policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States. My understanding, he is cooperating more now. And um, so, it's, but the, what's evident there is that this is a really significant problem in Mexico, and it can't be swept under the rug. And we've had these, the 43 missing students who disappeared. I mean, it's just been one thing after another.
Thanks, Rick. Sorry, I'm not used to microphones. Um, so I want to ask you to talk a little bit more about something that you touched on and Peter even mentioned, um, which is you know when we think of the image of the other or the impression um, of another, usually race is in there somewhat. And I thought it was interesting you going back to the colonial period when I think of one of the big differences, you mentioned this between British America and Spanish America was the racial mixing, right? That, that didn't happen in the British colonies, but in the Spanish colonies, there was intermarriage and inter other things that produced a mixed population. So I guess I'm wondering what role you think that race played in all of that that you described, the desire, the danger, um, has that changed over the centuries that you've well, um Well, if, in terms of the Mexican elite, if you look at the uh, late 19th century, the discourse was one of European immigration. And, you know, the uh, Mexican elites talked about, you know, if, if we were like Argentina, they have way less people, but they're all white, like the United States. I mean, that's maybe a little bit of an overkill, it's unfair, and also it's claimed that Mexican President um, Diaz, who was a mestizo, put some concoction on, concoction on his skin and he's lighter when he's later in life. I don't know what it was. But if, and then if you move into the early 20th century, one of the appeals in Mexico was Jose Vasconcelos, who this famous writer in people like uh, Diego Rivera and Vasconcelos were very popular here in the United States. And he talked about the cosmic race, the raza cosmica, and this argument that you know the, this blending of peoples is actually superior to one race groups. And so it seems to me that it it's certainly at different moments, there's different takes on that. On some moments, it can be positive. You know, the idea of the anthropologist going to uh, indigenous country and you know seeing uh, traditional ways of life that are a, a nice um, alternative to modernity. But on the other hand, I mean, I think that there's been and there continues to be this idea of racial inferiority. Right, and the, the idea that th this is a distinct group racially and it's an inferior group and sort of American and Anglo ways are superior. So, I mean, it's... Yeah, and, I mean, do you see that throughout the 18th and 19th centuries as a kind of justification for conquest? I mean, I'm not sure. Okay, a racial... Well, I mean, yeah. I guess there's a thing of the, the, the white man's burden. The, in the Mexican-American War, I think my sense is it focused more on the leadership. And I could say that actually in the war itself, there was this movement for all of Mexico. And you know, Polk apparently, when uh, his negotiator came back and only had half of it, I guess that's what he was initially happy with, but he negotiated, but there was this big movement for all of Mexico. But one of the arguments was that, well, how are we gonna integrate those people? into our society. So it could have been, on the other hand, you know, a, a deterrent because northern Mexico, as you know, it wasn't nearly as populated. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so I really like the, the, the double articulation of, of this sort of warehouse of images, exotic Mexico, traditional Mexico, um, resource Mexico and so on. And it seems like, it, like what all of them have in common is that Mexico is presented, at least in the American imagination, as this possibility of modernity. Like they're, they're not quite there, but we can either go in the direction of you know, a better form of liberalism or this other version, whether it's like the you know, you know, in, indigenous forms or revolutionary forms or you know whatever alternatives people can uh, Americans imagine existing in Mexico and uh, it seems like both of those exist in, in at least in some way in, uh, in in a version of the what you described in the 19th century as the American triumphalism and I just wonder if um, as you know the demographics of the United States changes has changed and continues to change with immigration um, if you think other ideas about Mexico uh, will emerge in the American imagination as more, you know, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans participate in, you know, the imagination of Mexico, 
like what changes you imagine might take place? Is it, is it still desire, danger, controversy, or are there other things in the past that you think will, will kind of influence that image in the future? Okay, so how is the way the United States is changing in becoming, in Mexico sort of becoming more part of it, going to change images of Mexico? Yeah. Uh, um, well, it's interesting. This is a little off, but uh, we had a student do a presentation on um, the about the Zimmerman telegram, and I think he was here earlier. I don't know if he's still here. Oh, here he is. And, and uh, one of the points he made was that when they considered the issue of um, taking up Germany and aiding Germany in return for their previous territory that had been taken in the Mexican-American War, well, there was a lot of reasons they didn't you know, take the bait, but one of them was that there wasn't enough uh, of a Mexican population there. Maybe if it was today, <laughs> they'd think differently. Uh, so I think that what I see is that there's a huge debate, and what your question sort of brings forth to me, is that there's a huge debate in American society today. On the one hand, there's this, you know, this ideal, this concern that America's becoming too um, multiracial, too pluralistic. And on the other side, there's this realization that there is this voting block and that's growing and growing and the argument is they played a, an important role in Barack Obama's election, and that we need to sort of take a different perspective, maybe not, uh, it doesn't even have to be from a social or human, humanitarian angle, just pure numbers. Um, so I think that there's a, the, a debate how those people should be represented in, in included within the American society and polity. Um, as far as it influencing th those demographic changes that are going on today in the United States, how they might influence the way the United States understands and represents Mexico, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm not quite sure how that could be. I mean, on the one hand, as the population grows, there could be the argument that, you know, we have an impoverished nation to the south of us, and therefore people have to escape it. Um, the so that could be one of the takeaways that that we get from it. Um, I guess that the other possibility would be one of the, the the dean's mentioning of the bridges, and this idea that these people that live in our communities are. Americans, and because they're Americans, they, there's a common bond that we share, and therefore maybe our links with, Me maybe, maybe Mexico won't be so exoticized anymore. That's a possibility. 